Tonight we're here in Howell City Hall. Welcome to Question Time. Good evening and a big welcome to you, whether you're watching on television, listening on the radio, here in the audience, and to our panel tonight, the Conservative Community Secretary, Greg Clark, Labour's Shadow Home Secretary, Andy Burnham, the former leader of the Scottish National Party, Alex Salmond, the writer, former director of the Centre for Policy Studies, Jill Kirby, and the founder of one of Britain's biggest hedge funds and the chairman of the ARC chain of academy schools, Paul Marshall. Thank you, thank you. Well, we're ready to go. Just before we do, remember Facebook, Twitter, if you want to comment on what's said, text us 83981 uh, and you can push the red button and see what's said by others. Our first question is from Philip Green, please. Philip Green. Uh, in light of the, remark, uh, the remarks made by Ken Livingston, is there an issue surrounding anti-Semitism within the Labour Party? The remarks made by... Yeah, shout of yes. Well, let's, let's hear what our panel says. The remarks were... Uh, were uh, that Hitler was supporting Zionism before he went mad. He said on the radio this morning and uh, late this afternoon he was suspended from the Labour Party. Alex Salmond. I, I think there's an issue about Ken Livingstone. Uh, the, uh, I, I think... Uh, I, I'm in a position... I, I don't think that Naz Shah, she was the Labour MP uh, whose suspension started this, uh, I don't actually think she should have been suspended. The reason, she, if you remember, she, she made an offensive retweet some two or three years ago, which was a, a shameful thing to do, and it was the wrong thing to do, and it was certainly anti-Semitic. Uh, but then she made an apology yesterday in the House of Commons, which was a fulsome apology, a graceful apology. And she's a young MP, and, you know, unless there's some sort of thing I don't know about, some sort of track record of this behaviour, which there doesn't seem to be, I don't understand why she was suspended. However, I certainly understand why Ken Livingston was suspended. Uh, and I should declare an interest here. I, I'm a a board member of the, the Holocaust Foundation, that's the Holocaust Memorial Foundation, which is, is working to get a suitable memorial uh, to commemorate the, the Holocaust, and so that future generations can understand why it was the most devastating event of the 20th century. Uh, Ken Livingston's been in politics a long time, and he would know a great deal better than to use the, the, the Holocaust or, the, uh, uh, or Hitler as a debating point uh, or no more than people should use it as a joke. It's right above and beyond that. Uh, it's something which should be... We're, we're, tomorrow, I think, is, is the anniversary of Dachau, the liberation of Dachau. Uh, and for Ken Livingston, with all of his experience, to make that point was absolutely shameful. I think he was rightfully suspended. However, I think we should be a bit more generous to uh, Naz Shah, the, the young mm. MP, who apologised. I, I think... Ken Livingston was rightfully suspended. Jeremy Corbyn did the right thing. And if he needs to take further action against other people in the Labour Party, I hope he's got the guts to do so. Mm -hmm. Andy Burnham, is, is there an issue about anti-Semitism in the Labour Party? If, if I thought, thought for one second, uh, David, that I was a member of an anti-Semitic party, I would cut up my membership card right here, right now, and send it back to them. That's what I would uh, do. But I don't believe that that is the case. But let me say what I think is the case. Firstly, that these allegations, when they're surfacing, are not being dealt with uh, properly and quickly uh, enough. They need to be dealt with much more speedily uh, in the future. The second thing I would say is, it is clear that some people in the party have made anti-Semitic comments. And like Alex, I find uh, Ken Livingston's comments uh, ill-advised, offensive, deeply uh, distasteful. The question is, and it's true for Naz Shah as well, the question is, were those comments made carelessly, inadvertently, or was there real intent behind the comments? And that is why they have to be investigated and people have to have a chance to put their, put their reasons. So you can't rush to judgment. You have to allow that. It's why suspension is right now. But let me just be absolutely clear with you about this. If anti-Semitism is found, then expulsion is what should follow. No ifs or buts. So, um, Joe Kirby, of course, uh, Jeremy Corbyn says there is no crisis in the party, and people who claim there is a 
nervous of the strength of the Labour Party at local level. Do you see it like that? Well, I, I, it seems to me that this is a crisis brought upon Jeremy Corbyn in large part by his attitude towards the party, towards its own, um, towards prejudices that, that are existing within the party. I'm quite sure Andy doesn't hold them, but they, they are there within a party that can select and, uh, and choose Naz Shah as a suitable candidate. Did no one look into her record? This was, you know, this wasn't just one retweet, as far as I understand it. There were other comments that she had been passing around, and we, you know, we all know the dangers of social media. You see something stupid that catches your eye and you, you pass it on, but she had a somewhat of a track record. It wasn't just one random thing. And, you know, Andy says we have to ask him whether there was an intent. Well, you know, someone who wants to, wants to be in public life, who visualises themselves having a responsible role, is that, does it make any... You know, they've done, she, she chose to participate in a dialogue which involved likening sending the Jews to America to transportation. I mean, it was clearly, you know, most of us, would anybody in this room consider that as a good thing to pass on, even in a moment of kind of frivolity? You just don't do it, do but you? It, but the question was whether th there is an issue around this in the Labour Party, or whether it's just one well, case, I think two cases. Well, I think there is, because uh, we saw that yesterday, it wasn't until David Cameron, I think, had pointed out that surely it was time for the whip to be withdrawn, that the whip was finally withdrawn. I mean, this was all out in the open, and Jeremy Corbyn didn't decide to do anything until it had come up in Prime Minister's questions. I mean, this is no kind of party yes. management, is it? And then to see Ken Livingstone, who we know was brought, brought back into the fold by Jeremy Corbyn as his special adviser, and we know that Livingstone already has a, has a terrible track record of making anti-Semitic yeah, remarks, as well as, as I, plain offensive I, I, remarks. I agree with you about... Uh, Ken Livingston and the experience he has, but I, I don't think it's fair to say that about Naz Shah. I mean, I, I've got no knowledge. I mean, I'm not in the same party. But is it the kind of thing I, that, no, no, that... I've got no knowledge that she has done what you say she's done. She's somebody who made a mistake several years ago. She admitted it. She apologised, a fulsome apology, and I think we should give her a bit of All slack. Right. And certainly not attack her when she's not here to defend her. And the only other thing I'd say... Oh, no, that's David Cameron, moment, uh, Alex, who talks cause... about a swarm of migrants, you, sir, the fourth, is the last though. person to complain about racism. You, sir. Thank you. Can I just clarify? Anna, did you just say uh, careless racism was in some way excusable? I'm sorry, racism is never excusable. Whether it's careless or otherwise, it is simply not on. No, I didn't, didn't say that. If, I, if that's what you understood, then no, that's not what I meant at all. I'm saying that people sometimes can inadvertently say something and it can be read a certain way. Because it's often the case when people are commenting on the Israel-Palestine situation. I think I, I dislike uh, the language that's used at times against Israel. Uh, and sometimes it can go over that line and then appear anti-Semitic. It doesn't mean that the person who was saying it... Wait, just let me make the point. It doesn't mean that they are an anti-Semite. It just means that their comments appeared anti-Semitic. So okay. I think you do have to investigate it. Or just appear if you, Just let me make the point. If you, if you, you have to investigate it, and if you find that they meant it, then they have to go. Um, and that is the bottom line. OK, Greg Clark, I'll come to you in just a moment. Let's just hear from one or two other members of our audience. You in the blue shirt there. OK, so at the minute we're talking about is there anti-Semitism in the Labour Party? What issues... Is the party actively tackling to not allow members to have if they're going to voice that, especially if they are members of public office? So, so what's your assertion, that Labour is too easy on who it allows in? Yeah, what measures is Labour going to take to actively discourage people from joining the party All right. and then representing the, the party Don't answer Parliament? straight away. I'll come back to you, Andy, on that. And you, sir, over there. How forgiving Andy and Alex would be if it was a member of UKIP that had said these things. Yeah. All right. All right, we'll come to I do think this is a, a serious moment. What we know about anti-Semitism uh, over the years is that it's a virus. Uh, it is never suppressed and eradicated completely. Uh, it emerges from time to time uh, in different countries uh, and at different moments in different guises. As soon as it appears, it has to be crushed very decisively because it will happen again and again. And so... I think this is an important moment uh, for, for Labour. Uh, I'm, I'm sad that the Labour Party, whose traditions uh, have always been to, to combat racism, uh, should be going through this. And I think it's right that Jeremy Corbyn uh, should 
uh, be required to act absolutely decisively. Because if you don't, and you see it in other countries around the world, if you let it fester, it will grow uh, and it will be even worse uh, in the future if it's not gripped now. Right. I, I, but, uh, I'll come, I will come to you to end that. Paul Marshall. So, so it's, it, this is an issue which is very important to me personally because last year I discovered that my wife's family lost quite a few members in the Holocaust. So it's, it's not a, a trivial matter for me. And um, uh, I think that uh, the the views that are, were expressed by Ken Livingstone are part of a wider world view, and this is what I find worrying, which is, which is shared by Livingstone, McDonnell, and Corbyn. And that view is essentially rooted in anti-Americanism and, uh, and support for victims as they see them of all kind, whether that be Hamas, Hezbollah, uh, or the IRA. And part of that world view is also an opposition to Israel. And, uh, and it, they're all linked together, and uh, that's why. And it finds expression in this what they call anti-Zionism. And if you look on the web, you get this use of the word Zio, which is increasingly becoming used as a as a form of anti-Semitism, as, as a different way of saying Jew. So it, it's a very, it's quite virulent, as as Greg says, and it's very much within the London uh, clack of uh, Labour leadership. And it is therefore very dangerous for the Labour Party and for the country, and it has to be rooted out. And the, to link to another subject, which will no doubt come up tonight, uh, Ken Livingston said last week that if uh, we voted for Brexit, he would think of, uh, about emigrating, and that might be a solution to everything. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not defending in particular what these politicians have said, but I think over three times over the past year I've seen in political contacts the use anti-Semitism used as a political tool in the NUS presidency, in the young NEC rep, and now. Anti-Semitism is not the same as disagreeing with what Israel do. It's not yeah. the same yeah. thing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, right. Wait a minute. Wait, wait, wait. So, uh, I, let, let, I want to move on, but I want Andy Burnham to answer the question that came from over there, which was, is Labour doing enough yeah. to stop people joining? And you know the attacks on Labour from the Board of Deputy of British Jews on Jeremy Corbyn. Um, there have been various uh, people who've had to resign for other anti-Jewish remarks. Sure. And can you answer his question? What's being done to stop this? I will. I mean, because the gentleman there said we've we been too forgiving. Well, I'm not, actually. I mean, I think, unlike Alex, it was right to suspend Naz. So, yes. As Paul, root it out. Find it and root it out. Absolutely no question about it. What's the party doing? Well, somebody said it. I mean, we are the party that for decades has promoted equality, has fought discrimination. You know, Jeremy Corbyn's done all that all his political life, if you look uh, at his, his record. So the party has to get better. I don't think it has been good enough. I said that at the very beginning. It's not been good Why enough. Why has he been so slow? Well, I don't know. It should be quicker. It should be quicker. And I'd like to see quicker and more decisive action uh, taken. I think he has taken action, but it could be, it could be quicker. Uh, okay. But I just want, to, just want to be absolutely uh, to be clear about this. You know, I would resign tomorrow if I thought I was in a party that was promoting anti-Semitism. I think the point was made very well, though. There's a, a world of difference, isn't there, between criticising the, the actions of the Israeli government and indeed questioning whether Israel should exist. And it's when people go over that line, they're veering into the, the realm of anti-Semitism. And it's at that point, I think, that you have to take a very different approach. But you have to be careful before you label somebody an anti-Semite or a racist. Right. We've got half a dozen hands up, but I... <laughs> so, forgive me, those of you who've got your hands up, but I do want to try and get through a number of questions tonight, if we can. I want to go on to our next one from James Blake, please. Who else should be held to account over Hillsborough and the ensuing cover-up? Greg Clark. Well, I think all of us were appalled at what we saw in terms of the, uh, the stories that are coming out of that uh, inquest and the, the incalculable injustice that decades, for decades, people uh, have not known the truth uh, about what happened to their nearest uh, and dearest. Uh, when it comes to accountability, I mean, the first thing I want to say is to, uh, to praise uh, Andy Burnham. Anyone that saw... <laughs> Andy had a difficult time some years ago and used that uh, experience when uh, he was meeting their relatives to have an absolute determination to get justice. 
Uh, and it was, for those of you that saw the scenes in the House of Commons uh, a couple of days ago, uh, it was incredibly impressive, and Alex uh, spoke uh, as well uh, in that. The unity uh, of purpose uh, in making sure uh, that the, uh, the lessons can never be uh, forgotten and that justice is done. So James Blake's question is, who should be held to account? So what I would say is that I think we've now got the truth uh, through these verdicts. What we now need to see is justice, and that requires the, uh, the criminal investigations that are now uh, going on. Uh, to, to continue. Obviously, it's a matter uh, for the prosecutors, uh, but I think everyone would accept that there needs to be uh, consequences uh, if a criminal case uh, is proved from what has been a very clear verdict. Okay. You, sir, and Pink. Um, I think if we're holding people to account, the, the behaviour of the Sun newspaper this week, not only from the headline 27 years ago, but to not even print it on their front page, I honestly ask how Rupert Murdoch can sleep at night. It is the most disgraceful behaviour. <laughs> It's utterly, utterly inhuman. Okay. And how? And you said that. Uh, you said this happened about Fred How day. Kelvin McKenzie could say he's a victim of the press, uh, the police, sorry, is uh, something yeah. else, isn't it? You, you sir. I was at Hillsborough in 1989, survived the crush, uh, and climbed over the fences onto the pitch. So I also I feel to be a victim of South Yorkshire Police. I think the question said, who else other than South Yorkshire Police? I don't think South Yorkshire Police have yet been held accountable. They've had an inquest where a decision's been made, but there hasn't been any accountability yet through the criminal courts, and I think it's only when criminal accountability arises and senior officers are in charge on the day and successive senior officers who've been involved with, with South Yorkshire Police since 1989 up until today's date, uh, until they are held accountable in the criminal courts, there is no accountability, and, until, and that has to happen for justice to happen. <laughs> Um, as, as everyone knows, Andy Burnham, you were very close to this and pursuing the, 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 the demand for a proper inquiry. What's your answer to the question mm. of who should be held to account? Well, nobody has yet. So there's a lot of people uh, now who need to be held to account. And accountability, in my view, means prosecutions. That's what needs to follow. Because think about it. How on earth did this country get to a situation where people, ordinary people, who did nothing more than wave their loved ones off to a match, how do we have a situation where they ended up in a courtroom 27 years later begging for justice and pleading for the reputations of their sons and daughters, their brothers and their sisters. How on earth did that happen? You have to hold the whole establishment to account, in my view. You have, you have to hold politicians to account on all sides. No politician, in my view, did the right thing in the early days. No one comes out of this with any great credit. But it is the South Yorkshire police that have to be held uh, to account. This police force has consistently put protecting itself before protecting people like yourself who suffered harm and horror at Hillsborough. They have perpetrated a 27-year cover-up that was advanced in the committee rooms of the House of Commons and in the press rooms of 10 Downing Street. Shamefully, they carried on that cover-up in the courtrooms in Warrington, spending millions of pounds of public money rerunning discredited lies. That is the level of change that we need to see here. We need to see real change and accountability at South Yorkshire Police. I don't blame the ordinary men and women who tried to help on the day, the policemen and women, or indeed those on the streets trying to keep South Yorkshire safe today. But by God, they've been let down by the leadership of that force over many years. <laughs> And I, to me, it was <laughs> Real change there. But as the gentleman said, the media has to be held to account too. Because that front page, those lies were told at Liverpool's moment of greatest grief. My constituent who came home after his friend had died at Hillsborough picked up that newspaper and was told he was to blame. That is why Liverpool has felt this so deeply for all of these years. We need to see people who are held into account. We need Leveson too, so we have a proper framework for accountability in terms of police and press relations. But the last thing I'll say, just if I could, a positive, if, if I may. I hope Hillsborough will change the country. I want to change the law so that police officers can't retire to escape misconduct proceedings and keep their pensions. <laughs> but I... I also want, last point, David, I also hope that 
the country will look differently at Liverpool uh, now. You know, the, the fight that has been mounted. For years, they were looked down upon on, by many people, called self-pity city by Boris Johnson. But do you know what they really are? Solidarity city. Red and blue <laughs> together. And <laughs> in the end, those values of Liverpool have shone through. Liverpool has prevailed. The families have prevailed in all adversity. And that's the final thing that I would say. You know, when I used to go around the country in the years when they said, why won't the Liverpool people move on? You know, what's the matter with these whinging scousers? The end of this story is this. At the end of the day, David, you know what? Those whinging scousers just happened to be right. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Also, I'd just like to c correct Mr Clark. I don't think the Hillsborough families have waited for decades and decades to learn the truth. I think they knew the truth all the time. They and what they've had to wait for is for the establishment to be forced to face up to the oh. truth. And I would say thank goodness for the families of the H Hillsborough uh, disaster and thank God for the Liverpudlians. Yeah. Yeah. Joe Kirby. And, and let's, let's say thank God for the jury system in this country True. too, because yes. yep. those were the people who in the end were able to give a clear decision. Um, and it's not a system that prevails any further in Europe, I think, than in the UK, and it's a very important system of arriving at justice. Um, so, so I think, you know, all credit to that jury too. And, you know, of course, we, you can see how this began, partly because people on the whole want to trust the police. We wanted to trust, we still want to trust the police because they carry our lives in their hands. And so, it was difficult to begin with, probably, for many people to accept that the police could have acted in this way. Um, but, of course, we see also from, from an initial attempt at cover-up how it ballooned and how, you know, one lie developed and developed. And, you know, rather than admitting quickly, I made a terrible mistake, someone said, I didn't do it, or I did something different and tried to pass the blame on... And so, you know, deceit swells into this huge... And now, you know, 20 years on, it's still being unravelled. Um, and that is a terrible thing. But, you know, thank goodness that we have arrived at the truth okay. in the end. But there are other... But, the, uh, and, and, but, no, but you know, the, there are... Had the police not acted... They did, they might, it might, we might have found out a bit sooner, too, all the other people implicated, like the... the you know, the sellers of tickets for that ground who knew these people couldn't be accommodated, the health and safety issues, so many things that have eventually been corrected. But, but because the police did not act as they should have done at the start, all those other things were, you know... All right. The, 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 well, that's a good point. The, the woman then... You. So would the panel agree that for Bernard Ingham to have so much to say at the time for the fact that he's refused to apologise since, mm. that he should have his knighthood uh, stripped? But... This is Thatcher's press secretary, yes. Bernard Ingham. I, I can't speak to, to Bernard Ingham, the Bernard Ingham situation, but I, I, looking at it, first of all, it is, I want to pay tribute to Andy as well because it normally, as, and as the outsider on the panel, I'm not, a, I'm not a politician, everybody likes to knock politicians. This is one of the great uh, examples of a politician really doing great work and, and fighting for justice, and, and I pay tribute to it. Um, for me... Looking at it today, uh, it is a massive injustice that's been done and it's blighted the families of those lives for their, for their whole lives, their whole lives. And uh, looking at it now, though, uh, there's a danger that the, we go from one m massive blame on uh, uh, the Liverpool families and fans to massive blame on South Yorkshire police. There are young new recruits in South Yorkshire Police mm. who are coming in idealistic. They want to serve uh, their, their country. They want to do, do, do public service. So the issue is, as you said, who is to blame? It is the leadership of South Yorkshire Police through many generations, or several generations. And for me, as, as a, looking at it, the real rottenness at the core of it is uh, a, a determination to, to distort the truth, to mislead, on all levels. I, looking at the TV footage, John Motson, five, five or ten minutes after the crushing started, was saying that the fans had broken the gates down. So he had been fed... Told that. He was fed a lie, and it started five minutes in. 
And in the Sun newspaper, they were fed lies yeah. about pickpocketing and, and so on and so forth. So there was a systematic way of trying to manipulate the press. And you saw the same thing, actually, with Cliff Richard, which I thought was a very shocking thing. It was also the, through a media exercise, bringing the media in to make themselves look good before a man had been actually found, ch charged or found guilty of anything. So uh, that, that, for me, it, it's the top of the South Yorkshire Police where there's been rottenness to the core for many right. years. Alex Salmond. Well, I mean, Paul's obviously right. I mean, no one uh, blames the young officers going into the South Yorkshire Police, or for that matter, the young officers who were at Hillsborough, many of whom were trying to do their best to save the fans on the day. And what happened on the day caused uh, 96 uh, lives, bereavements for 96 families. But what happened in the day wasn't intended. The, the, the police made bad decisions. They were culpable. According to the jury, a jury who were allowed to hear the, the truth, unlike the first jury, it was, it was unlawful and therefore probably criminal. But it was tragic and unintended. Right. The real point is what's happened over the last 27 years wasn't unintended, it was a conspiracy. It was deliberate manipulation and lies and deception that have kept these, 27 fam these 96 families over the last 27 years fighting this agony, supported ably by politicians like Andy. Now, the point about Andy and Theresa May, the, the current Home Secretary, they are the first people in responsibility to answer the family's call. And shame on the predecessors of Andy and Theresa May who, despite, the, as the gentleman said, the overwhelming evidence, the Taylor initial report put responsibility where responsibility lay. And despite that, these families were unable to get justice. So what should be done? Well, what should be done is the people who were part of the conspiracy should be tried. They should be tried for perjury. They should be tried for perverting the course of justice. Um, They should be tried for conspiracy to pervert the course of justice with the exemplary penalties that these offences carry. But secondly, and I think it's equally important, what happened, why it took so long, was that these families had to go into hearing after hearing, court after court, and they were not badly represented, but there was a huge inequality between the representation available to these families and the institutional representation paid for by public money yeah. which was available to South Yorkshire Police. And that's the imbalance, that's the injustice, that's the unfairness that has to be rectified if what comes out of Hillsborough is this never happens mm -hmm. again. So right. I, I, go, I go to the woman up there and then to you and then a brief word from you, Andy. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Andy, you talk about accountability. What about the accountability of the people that decided to put those fences up, mm. to fen put them like cattle, yeah. for want of a better word, and yeah. if them fences hadn't been up, yeah. would have many pe as many people died? And you? Is, is that there had been a warning in the north, particularly with South Yorkshire Police. You know, the miners at Orgreave can tell you straight away. Um, it, it really is time that, and, and that goes right to the heart of government. Yeah. So it really is time that now, you know, we, 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 we go backwards again and we look at the mistakes that were made there. Because again, there was a, there was a, a conspiracy made, and actually, there's a real class issue here that needs to be addressed. Absolutely. Yeah. I, 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 come to, uh, very, very briefly. And then I'll, I'll I think one of the, the impressive things that's come out uh, this week uh, is the, the agreement um, between uh, Andy and the Home Secretary that all of these abuses need to be looked into. Uh, and uh, Theresa May made a commitment to Andy Burnham across the floor of the, uh, of the House of Commons um, that uh, not just uh, Orgreave, uh, but the other uh, scandals that have um, afflicted the South Yorkshire uh, police force, including... Uh, Rotherham, uh, for example, the, the child abuse, these, these all need to be looked at yeah. very seriously. Okay. And I, just, I think for a Home Secretary to be unflinching in, will, in being willing to, uh, to confront uh, these, uh, these shocking uh, questions that have been unresolved, uh, I think is a step forward for the way that we run our country. And, and you wanted to say I, a brief I, word I, on that? I, I do, and agreeing with everybody uh, on the panel. Um, why have we now got this verdict, 96 unlawful deaths? It's because what the lady said, there was just a complete disregard for football supporters' safety in that period. Let's remember, this was four years after the Bradford fire. 
four years after the Bradford fire, and yet we had those pens and those fences. I was an Everton supporter at Hillsborough the year before, and it was the worst afternoon I'd ever had at a football match in those central pens. I just looked at my brother's head all the games. I didn't want to lose him in the crowd because I knew how bad it was, and that's the era that we were, we were in. And it is class just to finish an us and them, wasn't it? Uh, and I would say it does need to go wider now. It is about power. The lady mentioned uh, Bernard Ingham. Yeah, he called the Liverpool supporters a tanked-up mob straight after as part of the cover-up. There, there is an elite in politics, in the police, in the legal system, in the media too, that colludes together to exercise power over ordinary people. That's the story of Hillsborough. But you do have to have the story of Orgreave, as the gentleman said as well, if you're going to know the full truth about Hillsborough. If we're never going to let this happen again, you have to fundamentally rebalance the system in the way Alex Salmond is saying and give ordinary people the ability to get truth and justice when they need it. OK. We must... Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. We, we must go on. Just before I do, we're in Manchester next week. Uh, we're in Aberdeen the week after that. The details of how to apply are on the screen there. You can apply on our website or give us a call. Uh, let's go on to another question. Completely different topic. Linda Robinson, please. If we stay in the EU, how can immigration be controlled to ensure that jobs and services are not stretched to collapse? So, Paul Marshall. Uh, it can't. <laughs> it can't. Uh, the, uh, the EU has a unique approach to movement of peoples. Uh, every other free trade zone in the world does not have any re requirement about free movement of peoples. Uh, and the EU has uh, an ideological commitment to free movement of people, which means that we uh, get, at the moment, about 250 to 300 million, 300,000 million. Uh, immigrants a year from the EU, which we can't do anything about, and that means that uh, Theresa May is having to restrict other types of immigrants from other places that we actually need. Uh, I know that in Hull, the, the, the immigrant population has, has tripled in the last, I think, 10, 15 years, uh, and mostly from the EU. Uh, now, that ex existing situation is now being compounded on a massive scale by a second mistake uh, by Merkel, uh, which is to uh, in invite a, a huge number of migrants from the Middle East and Africa, uh, which has created a, 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 a very large historic wave of immigration. Uh, if you think about um, the population forecast for the world in the next 20, 30 years is to go from 7 billion to 10 billion. Most of the, those extra people are going to be in Africa. They're all going to have mobile phones, and they're all going to be hearing about how great it is in, in, in the EU. So we, we've got a historic change in the whole debate about migration. And as you say, uh, that is going to, is already putting very big pressure on housing, on health, on our schools. Uh, and the, you, staying within the EU, as it's current, with the current set of policies, you can't do anything about it. So you're voting Brexit, I take it. it. You got it. <laughs> no one in there. I mean, that comes to you, Alex, I mean. Yes, the lady there. I can't believe what I've just heard, in all honesty. Everybody in Africa will have a mobile phone and will be able to tell each other how amazing it is in Europe. What a ridiculous statement. No, it's, it's do you, no, do <coughs> you understand yeah. that actually people in a lot of places <laughs> coming over through Europe, coming to our country, are doing it because they are desperate. Yeah. They are not doing it because they are having a little chat on Facebook well, about uh, how amazing yeah. this country is. It is a ridiculous thing to say. Well, actually, so some are doing it because they're desperate. A large number of the migrants into Europe are actually the wealthiest gr wealthier group of migrants, whether that be from Syria or from Africa, because, because they... they they, and they do have, a lot of them do have the access to a mobile phone. They Syria can see... Syria is a war zone. Yes. So, yes. you are telling me that yeah. the majority of people coming from Syria are doing so because they are wealthy. The majority the... of people coming from Syria are in fear no, of their the life. Pe the people coming... The majority... The majority... The majority coming from Syria to Europe are the ones who can afford to pay the, fee, the fees to get in. The ones who are poor... And what just about a minute, the 3,000 children the ones that are, are poor, coming the ones um, who are alone poor, from Syria? Are they right. wealthy? The ones who are poor are the, 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 
two million refu refugees sitting in Lebanon, the one and a half million sitting in Jordan, and the two million on the Turkish border. They can't afford to come to Europe. All right, let's go, let's go back to Linda's, Linda, Linda's question, which was how can, if we stay in the EU, how can immigration be controlled, she says, to ensure jobs and services aren't stretched to collapse. Alex Hammond. Well, it, it can't in, uh, in an absolute sense, of course, and, and that's right. But, you know, this debate between the lady and Paul is the very nux uh, of the argument here. Uh, you know, is the, are the people who've been uh, responding to this huge migrancy crisis, uh, are, they, are they people who are being pulled in by information about the wonderful life they could have in Europe, or are they people who are being pushed out by civil war and desperation? I agree with the lady. They are people who are being pushed out and are fleeing for their lives, and that is why so many of them have died in the flames. Uh, in a week, Paul, where the House of Commons, to its shame, had refused what the House of Lords suggested to take in 3,000 unaccompanied children in an atmosphere where 10,000 children have already gone missing in terms of uh, we don't know where they are, who are clearly in danger. And the sort of, and I'm sorry about this, but the sort of logic and argument that you've put forward is the excuse for why so many of these members of Parliament went through the lobbies and denied the right of even 3,000 children to come to this country mm. for safety and for security. But, but, but Alex, the, 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 the question, Linda's question is about long-term immigration. And as you know, the official figures, yeah. well, official figures, estimate 3 million more EU migrants yeah. uh, and up to 2030. That's the, I think that's the question you were asking, isn't it? Yes, she's nodding. That is the question. Not the specific interest yeah. of refugees and, from well, Syria. Yeah, but I mean, with respect, David, Paul took us very much on to, to that subject. Yes, no, but so, can you okay, go back right, to the other one? I, I would argue a, a different position in terms of, of people. We were talking earlier on. Uh, about uh, the, the Jewish community. Uh, and I mentioned I was on the, the Holocaust Memorial Trust. One of the things that that trust and that foundation is doing is not just having a memorial to, so that people remember the Holocaust. It's celebrating the achievements of the people who came to this country fleeing the terror of Nazi Germany and the achievements of their descendants. See, I take the position, I come from a country which has not suffered from immigration, but suffered over the last century and a half from emigration. <laughs> and all these Scots who've emigrated have made profound differences to the countries they've gone to, have achieved great things. So I don't like or accept the argument that immigration is a bad thing. I think immigration is a good thing, and I think strong societies have the ability to take the talents and abilities of people and make our country better. Alex, so I don't Alex, accept you, the premise of the question. You're talking about a very different question. Do you think no, that, do you think no, that all of the three million people who will come from Europe into this country over the next ten years are people bringing talents that we can't supply in this country? Do you think they're people who... I, who I think aren't that, they people who will come? Because, obviously, if we have a living wage here that is more than double what they can earn at home in Romania and Bulgaria, of course they will come here if they get the chance. So this they're, not is not coming, a, they're not coming for the benefits, then? Because that was the previous argument. They were all coming for the benefits. I don't think they are. No, so I think they're coming. They're coming. I think, right. and, I don't, and I don't understand a government that, on the one hand, is introducing a living wage that will beat well, all those wages. I don't understand and on this the other saying, full stop. And on the <laughs> other, <laughs> and on I, the other hand, do, saying that a tiny adjustment to entitlement for benefits, which may or may not be agreed living, by the ECJ, will, will, will be give enough a chance to stop them coming. It will be enough to stop them coming, because it won't. And the government can't sustain that Are they answering the question you asked? No. Go on, then. My question is, is that I have got no problem with the lady here about um, a political or any other asylum. That's mm. our kind of heritage, and mm. we should continue doing that. Mm. But I have worked in industries, HR and training, where I have worked with a production line that has been predominantly Eastern European, to the extent that one of our employees, who was British, went off with depression because nobody spoke to him in his own language for a 10-hour shift. And that guy was totally and utterly isolated. These people are great. They work hard. You can't say they're coming for benefits because they're not. They're coming because they want to work. The trouble is, is that we don't have a fine, uh, an infinite amount of jobs. We don't have an infinite amount of NHS or housing. We're a small Schools. country. 
you know, the no, 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 great job. Great job. We're sitting here in the, in the city of Hull, uh, which is one of the, the cities of the nation that has always been connected uh, with the, the world. Its prosperity, magnificent buildings like that, were based on being open to the world uh, and trading with the world. Uh, and we have very recently uh, in this city uh, a major investment. Everyone in this audience knows that Siemens uh, are investing a billion pounds uh, in this city. That will involve uh, some people uh, from Germany coming to work here, just as people uh, from Hull will go and work uh, in Germany. That has been part of the way through generations that we have succeeded uh, as a trading city. And I think, as Siemens have said, it would be a big mistake for the United Kingdom, uh, as well as for, uh, for them as a firm, uh, if we turned our back uh, on that tradition. Greg, and, they're and, and, in, and, in the and, full knowledge yes. that we're about to have a referendum. They, they've come here, they're investing in the full knowledge there is a risk of this country deciding to leave Europe. Siemens is not going away. Siemens has come knowing that that is a possibility. And, and, oh, and, and, this, this, this is nonsense. This is nonsense to suggest that th th these Greg things Clark, won't happen the figure, the, the figure given of three million new immigrants by 2030, are you happy with that? Well, that was a figure that um, the Office for National Statistics uh, have published before. Uh, and so what the, the government did, rather than to, uh, to use uh, a different figure that they'd estimated for the purpose, they said, right, we want to uh, reduce uh, immigration, but we will use the figure that is out there. And so that is what it's based and on. And you're happy with that figure? That would be all right. I mean, you answer the lady's question about schools no, and pressure on the National Health Service. And all this. Theresa May has been very clear that we do want to bring down uh, the levels of uh, immigration. But in terms of putting uh, that model out, um, I think responsibly, uh, we have because used she knows the, she can't. We've because used the she figures knows she can't that the Office change. of National but Statistics... She, says it's to, harder to, to, to she, she herself has said it's harder to control immigration well, being to, in the EU. To, to, Theresa has been very to, she, she has made, She's made the... She's, she's very honestly, actually, Theresa May made it clear that with the EU policy, she cannot control immigration and she can't control who comes in. The living wage is, is six times what it is in, uh, in Romania and Bulgaria. And of course, it's very attractive to them. So what uh, happens is that our immigration quota gets filled up with low-skilled workers, and we're not able to bring in the nurses, the teachers, the IT programmers that actually the economy needs. OK. The man there. In the, in the, in the pair, you, you, sir, in the pair of blue shirt. Yes. Three, three million people coming in uh, from, basically, Eastern Europe uh, in in the next 10 years is the equivalent of building 10 cities the size of Nottingham. How can the country cope with doing that? It's just and, impossible. Andy Burnham, can you answer? Andy, Andy Burnham, would you like to answer his point? Well, yeah, I will, but I'll go directly to the lady's question because I think you need an answer to that question. I'll try and do that rare thing of, if I can, try and answer. Because I'm very pro in. I think it's in the country's interest to stay in Europe. However, I do recognise, I do recognise your and the general concern about immigration. I hear many of the things you've said in my own constituency. So my answer, you wanted something practical, didn't you? My answer would be, look at protecting skilled wages. Because why are production lines like the way you described? It's because companies go around, go to agencies abroad and bring in huge numbers. Of it creates a draw for them to bring people in. If there were European abroad. rules that protected the wages of the skilled workforce, there wouldn't be that incentive for them to go around and bring people in to undercut uh, the skilled uh, wage level. And that's my vision of Europe, a social Europe, a people's Europe that works but Andy, for everybody. The, the, the but the one thing I just would say, will help just that, to put so it in we'll context, you, you do have, we all have to remember in this debate some of the points Alex rightly made. Number one, immigration is not a one-way street as it's sometimes presented. There are thousands, millions of British people around Europe, well, either spending Andy, time in Spain or, or working abroad, that people are as my this country dad did at the rate before. Which they and are also, in. You know that. they are net you know that. contributors. Totally dishonest. Uh, people coming in overall are net contributors. They are, tend to be younger, they tend not to have dependents, they add uh, to the British economy. And as you rightly said, ref the refugee situation is entirely within our control because we're outside Schengen. Right. And if we were to leave the European yep. Union and wanted the trade benefits, we'd have to accept free movement. Joe Kirby. Joe Kirby. I just am fed up with the lines being given by the government and joining in with the, with the Labour. Talk about elites. We are.
We are being browbeaten into thinking that life will stop when we leave the EU and it's got to be a when, not if, because we cannot control our future, we cannot control our borders. David Cameron wants to pave the way from Ankara in Turkey to Brussels so that Turkey can join the EU. 75 million people, Turkey is bordered by Syria, Iran and Iraq. Do we think that's going to improve our security situation? Do we think there is a possibility that yes, we will know who's at large in you? Europe, in an enlarged Europe? All right. This is crazy. We Politicians who are telling us now that we can't leave Europe, only five minutes ago were saying, oh, they were worried about this. Theresa May is worried about it. Well, in that case, go with what you believe and we leave. Just let me come back on what you're saying. No, because right. you're, no, no, no Sandy, I want to hear more from the audience. We've got to have, we must have some kind of discipline of question and answer, not everybody speaking over everybody, because then nobody can hear. The man in the blue shirt put a question. I'd like to go back to him, and maybe, Greg Clark, you would answer it, because Andy answered another one. You, sir with the spectacles. Yes, let's say you're, you're looking at three million people coming in. Let's say it's the equivalent of building ten cities the size of Nottingham in that time span and all the drains on social services, uh, health, schools that, that, that will go with those ten cities. How are we going to cope with doing that? Bas basically, it's, um, they're, they're economic migrants coming in from Europe and they're going to be a, a massive drain right. on and our resources. And you're the communities, you're the communities <laughs> minister or secretary of state, so what's your answer? Well, two things I'd, I'd say. I mean, first of all, as part of the, uh, the negotiation, we have for the first time uh, the ability to require people to contribute to the benefit system before they can uh, draw up. That is a very significant change. The second thing uh, goes to the point that the, uh, the lady made uh, earlier about um, uh, many people uh, working, uh, coming from Eastern Europe to do jobs that uh, other people uh, from this country uh, haven't been doing. Uh, actually, what we've had is the, uh, the introduction of the national living wage uh, and the increased pay uh, can help make those jobs uh, more uh, attractive for people uh, here uh, that uh, haven't been doing them in, in the past. But I've got, there's a question I think that needs to be uh, answered by Jill and Paul. If we do leave the European Union, uh, what are we going to do? Are we going to require visas for people from, uh, from Spain and France to come into this country? Is that the, the plan? You know perfectly well we won't need... We, if we don't choose what, what to ask visas, we Paul, won't, but I think Paul, I'd like to see... Paul, Paul, I think there are a good many countries well, who should have to... Paul, produce you take one. this one, please, because Jill's answered several. We, we, can choo we can either cho choose to ask them to have visas or not but choose to ask them to have visas. what is the proposal? We need, need, need to, to have some clarity. It doesn't need to be a proposal. It'll be part of, of the negotiation. We need to know what it would be like. Uh, if we left, which countries uh, do you want to, within the European Union, uh, prevent people from uh, coming? Is it France? Is it Spain? Which ones? It's not a matter of countries, Greg. It's a matter of whether okay. the people have skills that we need and that we want to make space for here because they will bring something to this country that we can't provide at home. So there may be... There will, and, you know... Other civilised countries can operate such systems perfectly well. We simply don't have the choice at the well, moment. The right. And we can't no. get the choice. I want, to go back to our, I want to go back to our audience. Now, uh, we've heard from a number of people worried about immigration and presumably also voting Brexit because of it. I'd like to hear, because I know you're fairly evenly divided, from people who'd like us to remain uh, and see... Oh, if your hands go down. All right, you, sir, there. <laughs> Uh, the man in pale blue behind you, yes. Um, I'm undecided on the remain or leave, right. over whether we should leave. But I just want to refer back to Jill's point about the 75 million Turks coming to the UK. That's a real it's a scaremongering, saying that 75 million people are going to come here. That's not going to happen. And for Turkey to join the EU, they've got, they've got to fulfill, I think, 20 conditions. And the reality is they only fulfill three of them at the moment. So for them to join the EU, it's a long, long way off. It's yes, not going to happen any time soon. And you here, no. I think as an African who's got a mobile phone to phone his relatives <laughs> about the good life here, <laughs> I think it's an offense. It's a very offensive remark that has been used by the gentleman in the far corner there. I think as a migrant, life is not easy in the UK. I think the misconception that uh, we hear all the time when we're in the streets or when we talk to people that we are here for the benefits, we're here for that, we are all here or we move around the world to better our lives. That's the bottom line about Im immigration. Everyone moves where they can see they can make a better life for themselves. So the whole EU referendum for me or for my colleagues, other immigrants, is a referendum on immigration. 
because if the numbers are not, were, not as, were not shown to be as big as they are, I don't think we'll be having the EU referendum. What is your, what is your own, just if I may, your story? When did you come to Britain? Uh, I think uh, the personal story will be for another day, but I think <laughs> the, right. the, the issue is uh, the, there I, is a misconception. Can as, can as, I, as, as, I, I don't know what remark you're referring to, but I presume it's the earlier remark about uh, the, the, the large-scale migration. Because you are... It's about you, everybody uh, having mobile well, telephones. Yeah, so... Well, you, so yeah, no, so... so, so brought in by yeah, mobile so, No, no, so... Well, there's a lot of that that goes on. Uh, so, there are, uh, there are two issues that are being conflated here. You, you did... One... No, there are two issues that are being conflated. One is the large-scale migration that is now starting, which is a kind of economic phenomenon, and the other is the refugees linked to, uh, to Syria and the Middle East, and they're very different issues. So in my remarks, I was referring to the, the risk of large-scale economic all, migration. All migration is economic migration. No, it's not all. No, let me no, explain. Not. Let me explain. Wars disrupt economic activity and livelihoods. So when that happens, people move to places where they're safe to continue their lives. Yes. Because I'm telling you this because I'm an immigrant. Mm -hmm. So you are not a migrant. You can tell me what people move up as a migrant, what, it, what life is about. So at the end of the day, I think there needs to be factual uh, arguments in regards to okay. these issues. Let, that uh, we've, got, we've only got, we've only got, we've only got uh, six or seven minutes left. Just one point about the economy. Um, Greg Clark, will we be better off, richer as a society? Will people be richer if we stay? Yes, we will, and um, you, you just need to, to look at all of the, the respected commentators, from the, the Governor of the, the Bank of England uh, to the OECD uh, to the leaders uh, of our trading partners right across the world, not just in is Europe, this your strongest but right argument around for the, for voting uh, in? the world. I think we, it is very clear from everyone uh, that like Mark has Carnegie, commented uh, like on this, Mark that Carnegie we would, we would lose right? uh, our access to, uh, to markets and prosperity if we were to take this big risk of leaving right. the EU. And Jill, and would we be better off or not? The OECD is funded by the EU. Nobody knows what growth is going to be in the next quarter, let alone 15 years ahead. What's your nobody opinion? Can forecast. No, oh, nobody knows. <laughs> so, I think we should be... Do you, do you Brexit I, I with your fingers crossed? Will be, no, effect? I think we will be better off because we will be free to make decisions which are in our you're, own interests you're a, as a strong world well, class. Jill, Jill says it as though... And we won't though, be handing we'll over... We what, won't be handing over... Though, we'll we won't be handing we over 350 million pounds every week to Jill, an unaccountable, undemocratic, Jill, elitist Jill says it as though we'll just go... Right. Jill says okay. it as though we'll go back to what we were. No, I, I don't would, want to go back anywhere. I want to go forward in freedom. Britain's history after the war, Churchill, was about building partnership in Europe. Britain is an outward-looking nation. If we leave, who will be the happiest, Russia or America? I can tell you now it will, be, it will be Russia. The patriotic case is to stay in, to be true to Britain's past. Yeah. Uh, and secondly, David... No, hold on, not secondly. Not secondly, all right. Who, who shouted out rubbish? Who said rubbish? Because he can add to the point. Who said rubbish? <laughs> was you? No, no. You? <laughs> OK. I'm... I mean, Europe in. will trade with us whether we're in or out. That's just a rubbish argument, Andy. No, the, uh, the okay. point I was making, the the patri Atlanta, I think it would lead you. not just to the breakup of Europe, and here's where I'll probably disagree with Alex, it would lead to the breakup of Britain We've as well. Got, because there'd be a demand We've for a second <laughs> referendum. All right, all right, all right. We've Britain got Alex Salmon here. Well, We've got Alex Salmon here. We've got a question from David Reid. We've got three or four minutes left. David Reid, your question. Yes, will Brexit lead inevitably to the breakup of the United Kingdom? Your call, <laughs> Alex Salmon. Well, I agree, I agree. We've heard it from Andy. I agree with Andy. I mean, if, if you had a situation where, and it looks like Scotland is going to vote very strongly in favour, but if you had a situation where Scotland was dragged out of, the, of Europe against the will of the Scottish people, then that would be a, a change in material circumstances that would justify uh, another referendum. Now, you might say, oh, well, what I'm going to do then is going to, I'm going to campaign for a breakfast to bring about that situation. Well, I'm not, because I believe, like Andy, that these islands' future is as a European country, uh, and we should do that because it's the, the best thing. But if the cards fall, as, uh, as you described, sir, then I think there would be another Scottish referendum, and this time I think that, yes, we'd win it. And one last thing. I am the last person in the world, having gone through that referendum experience two years ago, to have any respect 
for Project Fear, whether it comes from the Tory government or Project Fear, whether it comes from the Brexiters. Whatever else you do, make up your minds, not on the hideous things or the plagues of Egypt that will descend on this benighted country if it does one thing or the other. Make up your mind on principle, on whether you believe that we should share things with the other countries of Europe or whether you believe there are advantages in doing something else. Okay. Don't believe the scaremongers on either side. Paul Marshall. Uh, Paul Marshall. I, I, um, I, I, may not, I may not speak for uh, all the people who are in favour of Brexit, but if, if Scotland did leave uh, the United Kingdom, I regard that as a win-win from a Brexit. <laughs> because... because because, um, I actually Al Al I think it's far less uh, Al 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 Alex, Alex is a very canny politician and in, he managed to negotiate an even better subsidy uh, for Scotland than they previously had. They get, the Scottish people get £1,200 per person well, more than, than English people. You don't, you don't like and, refugees, and, you don't uh, like Scots. Is there anybody else you want to tell us? I like... I like everybody... You stand on their own two feet, and the Scots, like the Scots need to. <laughs> the Scots, the Scots need to stand on their own two feet. Yeah. They have a 15 billion pound deficit. Yeah. But uh, Alex Salmon, I've always taken to be a man of his word. Uh, during the Scottish referendum uh, campaign, uh, Alex said, as first minister, very clearly uh, that this was a once-in-a-lifetime uh, referendum uh, in Scotland. Yeah. Uh, and that people needed to bear that in mind. We knew that the, uh, the government was committed to having a referendum on the EU. He didn't mention it at the time. Uh, I think that he, he should be consistent right. with the position okay. that he took right. uh, and during, and this, and during, right. during and, and, the general election of last we, year, my successor stop, said we've we provoked a referendum, out of time. Okay. and we won 56 the, out of 59. This, of course, was, this, of course, once in a lifetime. this, of course, isn't a once-in-a-lifetime referendum, because everyone votes in. You can have another referendum in five years' time or ten years' time if you don't like the way it works out, can't you? Well, I think it's a big decision, and I... It's I, once in a lifetime well, if you vote Brexit, so. but um, if you vote in, you've got another chance. But I want to go straight to the question. I'll firstly commend Alex on his honesty, because he gave a very honest answer there before. But I also think, for the people sitting at home watching this programme tonight, I, in my view, he's just given them the single biggest reason to go out and go out and vote in. Because if you love Britain, if you love this country, if you want it to stay together, vote for it to remain in the European Union as a partnership and vote for it so that it stays together as Britain as a partnership. OK. Right. Little voice, my voice in my head tells me we're overrunning our hour and Andrew Neil will be very, very cross with oh, us. Good. So good. We're, <laughs> win, win. <laughs> win, win. <laughs> <laughs> so we have to stop. Um, I'm sorry to those of you who couldn't get in. We'll thank you for... Thank you for so many hands being up, but we can't do more than the hour. Uh, we're going to be... Perhaps you should come to Manchester next week, all of you. We'll start all over again. Um, we've got the former Chancellor Nigel Lawson there for the Tories. We've got the boss of Ryanair making a rare appearance on Question Time, Michael O'Leary. And that's in Manchester. And we're going to be in Aberdeen the week after that. So if you want to go to either of those venues, go to our website, call us on 0330 123 It'd be great to see you if you're listening to this on Radio 5 Live, and you can bear more. The debate goes on on 5 Live until the early hours, but here it comes to... Well, it comes to a halt in the studio. No, that will go on outside. My thanks to our panel and to all of you who came here to Hull. Until next Thursday from Question Time, good night. Review of the last seven days in politics continues here next on BBC One in this week, including a look at upcoming elections. On Thursday.